my financial channel and welcome to the Financial Juneteenth Five. These are my five most interesting articles as it relates to black finance, wealth, and business for today, September 29th, 2020. Let's go ahead and get started. All right, so the first article comes from Axios.com. Um, Axios is a new major player in the media space, uh, but it states that Brookings Fellow predicts reparations could happen within the next 10 years. And uh, the uh, fellow that they're talking about is a guy by the name of Andre Perry. And Andre Perry uh, states that uh, when I look out there, it's much more diverse coalition than I've ever seen before. And so I'm encouraged that reparations are going to happen. Uh, he states that thanks to growing momentum and changing attitudes among Americans, uh, Brookings Institution fellow Andre Perry states that uh, he thinks that reparations will be paid to Black folk uh, within the next 10 years or so. Uh, but uh, Perry also cautioned that uh, he also, while he believes reparations will be paid um, as a moral debt that is owed to Black people and should be paid out in the form of direct cash or check payments, Similar to the $1,200 payments that were a part of the CARES Act, uh, he expects any reparations provided in the near term will likely mean uh, means test funding uh, that benefits some, but not all Black people. Uh, so this is something to, I guess, uh, keep abreast of. It looks like we're moving in a positive direction in the reparations discussion, um, at least according to Andre Perry. In this article, there's also a two and a half minute clip uh, from uh, Andre on HBO and Axios. Uh, talking about this very issue. Uh, so please check out this link in the description. The next article comes from uh, our friend Diddy over at Revolt Media, uh, and it states that Newark Mayor uh, Roz Baraka launches 40 acres and a mule fund to help minority-owned businesses. Uh, so Roz Baraka is the mayor of Newark, New Jersey. Uh, he's also the son of Amiri Baraka, who was the uh, Black nationalist leader, um, the main leader of, I guess, the 1970s. Um, so in this article, is talking about a new fund. Uh, it states here that he's teamed up with Burnell Hall, who is the president and chief executive officer of Invest Newark, and Rain Wayne Meyer, president of New Jersey Council, or excuse me, New Jersey Community Capital, to launch the 40 Acres and the Mule uh, initiative, which will put uh, capital directly in the hands of minority-owned businesses who need it most. Mayor Baraka hopes this will help to close the racial wealth gap in the city of Newark and give deserving businesses that have real potential the tools that need to, to uh, thrive. Um, in this interview, so this is actually an interview format. In the interview, uh, Hall states, who is uh, a part of Invest Newark, uh, the purpose is to provide a sis uh, systemic response to systemic racism by creating a, a virtual cycle of e economic empowerment. Uh, we see the 40 Acres and the Mule Fund as the final leg uh, to the circle of economic empowerment, uh, which provides the capital that is hard to come by uh, to take advantage of these great economic policies that Mayor Baraka put, put in place. And in this uh, part of the interview, he talks about some of the other things that uh, Mayor Baraka has been doing uh, within the uh, city of uh, Newark. Um, so Barack is quoted in here too, but I found that most of the uh, best quotes actually came from uh, this uh, guy named Paul. Uh, so he states that, so the mayor has done a great job uh, making sure that both the city of Newark's website um, and Economic Development Corporation Corporation's website, uh, there are specific COVID pages uh, where uh, people can learn about these funds. So if you live in the city of Newark, uh, I highly suggest that you read this article. Um, because uh, there might be some money out there uh, for, uh, for you uh, to help your small black business thrive. The third article today comes from the Washington Post. Um, it states that wealth gaps between black and white families persist persisted even at the height of the economic expansion. Um, it states here, last year, the median and mean wealth for black families was less than 50% of that of white families, according uh, to, to the 2019 survey of co consumer finances. Uh, this is the issue, personally, I try not to uh, get, I don't want to say too worked up about, but uh, worry too much about. Um, I really want black people to thrive. Um, and I don't think that our thriving has to always be in uh, comparison to what white families and white people are actually doing. 
Uh, but I still think this is an informative article. So even during the boom time uh, final stretch of a record economic expansion, the typical white family had eight times the wealth of a typical black family in 2019 and five times the wealth of a typical Hispanic family. Uh, it states that last year, the median wealth for black families was less than 15% of that of white families. Um, according to this report, uh, white families had a median, median family wealth of 188,000 compared to that of black families, which is about 24,000. Uh, 24, um, it goes on to state, the current recession has put um, sharp focus on how the Fed can narrow persistent racial and economic gaps to rebuild an economy that doesn't leave marginalized communities behind. But it's unclear how the Fed can actually use its broad-based tools, uh, be it setting interest rate or hitting an inflation target to mitigate the country's racial inequality. Uh, so for example, they gave, it's about like lowering interest rates. While that can reduce unemployment, um, it also um, boosts the uh, stock market price and asset, uh, asset, prices, me, asset prices as well, uh, which uh, black people hold at a much lower rate. Um, but we don't have that problem here at the Black Finance Channel, the Black Business School, uh, where we uh, preach ownership whether it be in real estate, small business, um, or in the stock market as well. So uh, take this article, article for what it's worth. It was posted in the Washington Post uh, last night, I believe. The next article comes from Fortune Magazine. Um, so it's talking about Ursula Burns. Uh, she was the former CEO of Xerox, um, and she's turned her attention to corporate diversity and how she thinks big business is failing. Um, the majority of this actually is an interview on their Leadership Next podcast, uh, but Ursula talks through this. She uh, has a quote uh, that states, we have a responsibility to leave behind a world that's better than it is when we inhabited it. Um, at the moment, she says, business is failing to live up to that responsibility. Uh, towards, uh, toward its goal of increasing the proportion of racially and ethnically diverse uh, directors on corporate boards, the alliance is focused on getting Black professionals at the table. Uh, so this looks like to be a partnership between uh, Gabrielle uh, Salzberger. Uh, I'm not exactly sure who she is. Um, the Ford Foundation, so I need to do a little bit more research than her. And also the ELC, which is basically the... Um, Black networking group um, and community for corporate uh, CEOs and C-level executives um, throughout corporate America. Uh, so uh, the article also mentions that companies like Macy's, MasterCard, UPS, Uber, and the Dow have all signed pledges to increase their number of Black directors. Uh, but pledges like these have been um, done in the past. Uh, Ursula is really looking towards uh, putting additional pressure on some of these corporations to move a lot quicker than they have done in the last 30 or 40 years or so. The last article comes from The Atlantic. Uh, so this is not necessarily directly related to business, I guess it's business adjacent. Um, it talks about the limits of deseger desegregation in Washington, DC. Hugh Price and his family fought for him to be one of the first black students at his all white high school in DC. But once he was there, he could not wait for it to be over. So I did not know this, but uh, Hugh Price, the person that they actually followed in this article, uh, he also ran the National Urban League from I believe 1993 to 2004 um, or something like that. Uh, but it talks about you know his family, uh, his family growing up, or he, he growing up with his family in uh, the DC area, uh, both of his parents. Uh, were graduates of Howard University and lived very close to uh, the university. It also mentioned that he lived really close to Charles Hamilton Houston, uh, which is uh, one of the finest lawyers that America has, America has ever produced. Uh, but, you know, his, his parents and, you know, his parents were uh, really um, looking forward to having him to be, I guess, the, the uh, guinea pig to desegregate the schools because they didn't like living under, I guess, separate but equal types of laws. Uh, so it stays here, but first, like other Black parents who wanted their children to experience desegregated spaces and could afford it, they sent him to the private integrated Georgetown Day School, which was clear across the city. He didn't stay there very long, uh, but that was the uh, impetus, I guess, uh, the, the prequel to him actually uh, going to Taft Middle School. 
Um, later in the article, he states that it was a little tense. He was thinking about the times when white students used him in his classmates as punching bags. Uh, the once all white school had just integrated and there were 26 black students, including Price, in a student population of more than 850. Uh, so, you know, back in the, I guess, 1950s when this was going on, um, you could, you know, see how that could damage significantly the psyche of, you know, black children uh, being put in that type of environment. Um, but, you know, read this article, uh, we, you know, we often talk about segregation, or excuse me, desegregation as being the solution and integration and that type of stuff. Uh, but this article really shows the perils of looking um, at that particular issue. So, um, of course, he turned out okay. He went to Yale Law School and some other places. And like I said before, ran the National Urban League from 1994 to, until 2003. But uh, that's about it for today. So those are my five most interesting stories for the Financial Juneteenth Five. Uh, please let me know, know what you think about this segment. It's still new. So your input definitely matters uh, to me. Uh, also, before you get here, please make sure you like, share, and subscribe to the Black Financial Channel. Uh, once again, my name is Lawrence Watkins. You all take care. Be blessed and have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.